Welcome to this week's edition of Dugout Dish Podcast. I'm Andy Kirikides, joined by my wonderful host, who's rocking his Giants gear today, Keith Glasser. How we doing? Great, how are you? Good. We have uh, another special guest on this week. Excited to talk to him. Uh, he is a former Marine Corps member. He's a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, and he is currently the Director of Player Development at Jacksonville State, and we are lucky to have Anthony Silkwood on. Anthony, what's going on, man? How much? How you doing? Glad to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, the The Red Fox connection got us together. Um, as as you know, Coach Suplee at San Francisco connected us, and I'm, I'm glad we were able to find some time to get you on. So uh, before we start popping questions off at you, you got a pretty unique story pathway to get to where you are now and uh if you could take a couple minutes and just kind of walk us through your college baseball journey uh let the listeners know where it all started and where you are now yeah absolutely um Jen, just so up knows too like i'm gonna have to change his name and my phone to the red fox now that i know that's his nickname that, that it's exciting um but yeah no you want to talk about a route that's not normal or you know d- done often essentially um, you know, most of these guys like that I coach with their coaching career started after their playing career, but my coaching career really started before I started playing baseball again. Um, so I, I graduated from high school, 2011, decided to join the Marines. Um, uh, my dad told me I needed to get a job as I was taking a semester off school because I had a really bad GPA and, uh, he told me I needed to get up and get a job. And so I went up and joined the Marine Corps and, uh, kind of did that whole thing. Um, did that for five years. Uh, it was an absolute blast. I, I was a tanker, so I was a, a tank operator for the M1 Abram, M1A1 Abrams tank. Uh, during that time, I got to do a ton of different things. Got to train all over the country. Got to meet some of the, my best friends that I'll ever have forever. Um, absolute blast with that. 2014 and 15, I was deployed to the Middle East. Um, operate tanks doing that. Um, when I came back, uh, it completely changed my life. Uh, changed my life in a sense. I got to see the world, got to really uh, to see what it was like over there in the Middle East and, and see what the people and the cultures and, and, and whatnot, what that was like. And, and for me, um, it kind of changed my trajectory of the things that I was going to do where, you know, it became making an impact being a huge thing for me. Um, that started off with, with being the mental health advocate. Like it became a huge thing for me, you know, watching some of my guys go through some stuff and it just, it became a big part of me. And for me, it, it shaped me to kind of, want to make the impact and, and to really not so worry about my career impact to myself, but how can I impact others? Um, from there, did that. Uh, my last like six months in the Marines, um, I played on Team USA softball, um, played on the Marine Corps softball team. So I stayed really competitive. Um, a part of that was a pretty cool event. It was actually at High Point University. Uh, coach Cozart was the head coach at the time. Um, they did a home run for heroes event. Um, they sent some of like eight of us Marines up there and, you know, I was playing softball, so I was a great BP hitter. And then I was like, Hey, you know, we'll kind of get on the mound and see how hard I can throw a fastball. Well, it was 85, 86. I was like, okay, I'm going to get out and try to play baseball and, and just kind of do that whole thing. Uh, fast forward through all that, um, get out in 2017, play junior college baseball, do that. Um, got in Greg Wathen, um, gave me an opportunity at John Wood Community College and then um, he ended up passing away after that year, that summertime, um, I transferred to Parkland college, did that throughout that, um, finished up my career at, uh, Louisville university in 2021. And, and now we kind of kickstart to, to the coaching side of things where, um, that fall I jump in as a pitching coach at university of Illinois Springfield, um, absolute blast of a program, um, great, you know, great program, great history there, um, ended up going to the college world series in the 2022. Um, spring. With that being said, that winter, I decided to take my first job as a head coach as at Parker College. So, like, you want to talk about you know jumping right into the things. So, like, my first year of coaching, I was a head coach at a junior college, and the season before, I had been playing. So, it was a real awesome experience. Um, I can't, I can't, I can't be thankful enough for that. Because the amount of things that I learned in the first weekend on the road as a head coach was was substantial. So it was an absolute blast. Uh, it was something that, <laughs> that you get thrown in the fire, you figure it out, and, and it was an absolute blast. Uh, from there, we ended up 
we ended up doing that um, that whole season. That that whole summer, we did an entire roster overhaul. Um, completely flipped the roster, brought in 35 new guys. Um, for me, it was being very up, up front, very open, um, having standards, having having something that we had to meet, and and we needed to get the guys that wanted to do that. After that year, we won 46 games. Um, total into like I think 77, 78 games we ended up winning in those two years. And then, um, at that point, we had small Americans. At that point, we had we led the country in strikeouts in case per nine. Um, which I, I would assume got the attention of of Coach Beezer, who who hired me in the summer, and now we're here at Jack State. A lot of years covered there in that short amount of time, so I apologize. Got got a lot done in those years too. Talk yeah. about yeah. talk about bang for your buck. No, I mean, yeah, not a not a very uh, conventional path, but obviously it served you pretty well, moving pretty quickly, and I'm sure. A lot of that time in the Marines set you set you up to to take on stuff that might not be that straightforward all the time. I know Coach Glass can speak to the uh, the difficulties of transitioning to being a, a head coach at a, a relatively young age. So I'm sure you guys can have some some talks about that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So that old Andy. Well. I mean, Gosh. you had yeah, to you had to deal with Ferris your first year, so that's enough. Up Twitter and everybody, but whew, <laughs> only thirty-seven. Um, so you you can view this one through a couple <laughs> different lenses, right? And I'd be curious to hear it, kind of how you guys are doing it at Jacksonville State, as well as how you did it at Parkland. But how do you go about finding players in? maybe differentiate between the two and kind of get into some of the specifics at the JUCO side and, and kind of what that looks like from a recruiting perspective. Okay. So I'll speak for Jack state. I'm um, kind of like where, where I'm at now, obviously. Um, I think the biggest thing for recruiting is, is identifying, identifying talent's always the easiest thing, right? We can always see who's, who's good and who's not um, using trusted sources, using our camp to see people face to face and have communication with them. Just general conversation. You can tell a lot about a person. For me, I, I love reading people. I'm a people watcher. Like when I go out to eat, like it's it's a blast for me. I just I watch the room. Um, for the recruiting side of things, trust the sources, camps, um, and then and then obviously identify them early and then catch them in the summertime on the circuits and stuff like that. I think that's a big thing. But but really, the trust and sources, like you're going to hang your career on your players as a coach. You know, you want to trust the people that are coming from and trust the people that are around. So that's a huge thing for us. And then obviously on the JUCO side of that recruiting. Um, it's the same thing with junior colleges as well. Like you're not using travel ball coaches anymore, but you're using junior colleges who they know that the players have been, had been hard on the players. And when I say hard on means they've been coached, they've been held accountable. They've been, they've been had, they've had expectations and they've been met. They, they, they want to win and they hate to lose. And there's a big, there's a big aspect to that where you start to lose that. And I think some people are starting to lose that in travel ball where that's an intricate piece of the development where it's you want guys who hate to lose. If we lose and then, then we lose our job. That's just kind of the way it is. And and for me, I want guys that, that like winning and hate losing. So like, I think that's a big piece of development that we see at the JUCO level um, where guys start to kind of veer off a little bit. And then, and then the last thing that I personally that I personally look for, um, you give me a team of guys, you give me 40 guys that have dealt with adversity, and we're going to win a lot more games than guys who have never had any problems in their life. I promise you right now, the, the amount of adversity that me personally face, like in my time in the Marines and then Playing again, you know, that's, that's not even talk about like, you know, that type of stuff, but, but guys who've legitimately dealt with things that impact their life had dealt with adversity. Those guys I love coaching because there's perspective to it. And when you have perspective and you can coach with that and you, you have players that have perspective, then, then it changes the way they work. And I, I love it. Yeah. I think that anybody <clears throat> who coaches, like it's, you probably put it the best way that I think anyone's probably put it on this podcast so far. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people talk about it, like you embracing the struggle that is college athletics and, and college baseball. Um, you know, the, the, the amount of time, and I hate using this word and I'm going to use it, but I hate it. Like the, the grind that is college baseball from a, from a playing standpoint, I should say like, you know, I hate when people say it from a recruiting standpoint, but from a playing standpoint, like, you know, your, you got to go to class. You're playing 40 games, 56 games, it, it, depending on the level you're at. Like, you're traveling. You're depending on the conference you're in. You're jumping on planes. Like, it's a lot, man. And, and 
if you haven't been able to learn to, to handle some of that adversity, like you're going to struggle at the start and that's okay. You know, I, I think the one thing that, you know, we, uh, you know, as coaches that you want to teach into these kids and you want to try to, to parse out in the recruiting process is, you know, can they handle it? Right. Like that's, that's something that I think is, is paramount in the recruiting process. When you get to that character piece of like this kid, like when he struggles, what's going to happen. And, and, and everyone's struggle at every level is different, right? Like your struggle at Jackson state is different than the struggle at wake. That's different than the struggle when I was at RPI, but like everyone's going to have them and they face them. And how, how do you kind of get through that stuff? You know, what, uh, you know, I, I, I'd be interested to, to, to kind of hear, to, to pull this thread a little bit more, but like when, you know, whether it's at Juco or, or Jack state with what you're doing, like how, like how, how do you, I, like, how would you guys or, or you personally like identify that type of that type of kid? Because it's, I, I think you have an interesting perspective of like, you, you went to the military like you had to figure it out super early. And I, and I think there's a lot of, and I could be wrong. So you can tell me if I'm wrong, that's fine. I'm, I'm fine with that. Like, I think there's some parallels when you start talking about like the military and sports, like, you know, we can't like Andy and I kind of came up in the, the, the old school mentality of like, it was kind of drilled into you that way. But you know, like I've, I hated school, man. Like if I didn't go to school and I have a history of the military in my family, like I would have went into the Navy or the army or something like it was just, I, I was good at baseball and I got a scholarship. So I went to school, um, but I wasn't good at it. <laughs> like, you know, but I, like, how do you, like, how, how are you able to identify, like, what, what is it that you like and how do you identify that in kids that you think are going to be able to handle that, the, the type of adversity that kids are going to face? Well, I think, I think first off, you're absolutely right. There's what makes a good, I made a thread about this not so long ago, but what makes you a good Marine essentially makes you a good athlete. Like the, the hard work and dedication and the commitment and the, the, the playing for something above yourself. You know, I went from one team in the Marines to another team in college baseball. So for me, like it's, it's, it's extremely parallel. Obviously, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the coach that's like, Hey, we're going to war this weekend, guys. We're going to play this baseball game. Like that's not me. Um, but doing everything else in that fashion is, is me. Like my leadership, my leadership came from, from the Marines. And, and to be to be lucky enough to have my leadership taught from the most elite fighting force in the world, I'm very very fortunate in that. Whereas a lot of people in coaching learn from their coaches, which is great. I wouldn't cho- I wouldn't have choose a different path, that's for sure. Um, but to answer your question about like identifying that, it's it's all conversation for me. Like I'm a people person, and I like like I want to talk to the player. I want to know you know why you know why they tore their UCL their senior year of high school and why they got their offer pulled from from whatever university. I want to know why, you know, they feel like they haven't hit the strides that they want, you know, and this is, you know, for me more so at junior college level where I had a lot of guys who had been cut, who had been um, removed from the roster before they got to campus. Um, I had guys that had played at different junior colleges, but didn't feel like they're getting the development they want, you know, stuff like that happens all the time. But for me, it was just like, if I, if they understand why, and they're trying to close the gap on why they didn't get to where they wanted to be and they were actively doing it. Like to me, they're learning. They, they're learning, and when you when you deal with adversity and you get told, "Hey, you're not good enough for this college or university," and this is why, and they tell you, "Hey, they told me this, so I've been working on this, this, and this." Like, there's growth there, and there's growth that that I like to see, and like I like to uh, to kind of evaluate our guys with. So when we have guys that come in, and we have guys that you know, for instance, there's a guy here at, at Jack State, you know, through ten and just freshman year, he threw. Be the name of the sophomore year and got the, got picture of the year as junior college. Be the growth over that time. It's exciting to me. Um, I think dealing with adversity is a big part of that. Being told you're not being told you're not good enough in this day and age in college baseball it can either end you or it can motivate you. And when I say motivate you, that means you're consistently every single day. Motivation can fluctuate, right? But if you're committed every day, it's just always going to be there. So. That was a big thing for me, identifying talent at that level. Now at the four-year school, you know, for me, identifying guys who dealt with adversity, it's right back to it. Because for every every junior college kid, my there might be a freshman, there might be a guy at junior college who's a sophomore who spent his freshman at whatever university. You know, I had guys at the SEC at Parkland College. Well, those guys got to go somewhere else. And it's like, okay, so they they failed at this level, they came back, got their grounds again, had success. Can we bring him in? Have they dealt with it before? I don't look at so much as well. He didn't. He failed there. 
I'm going to ignore the fact that he hit 400 at the JUCO and then just go back to him failing at his first school. Well, every situation is different. You know, there's not a single, like I'm kind of one of those guys, like I feel like there's not a single pitching picture, picture in the world that I, I, I would just look at and be like, hey, I can't, I can't coach him, make him better. So like I look at it like that where it's like I want guys who dealt with adversity um, of someone's capacity. You know, there's a lot of stories out there of guys, regardless of the adversity and, and regardless of it's plain or personal or whatever it is, you know, conversation based is where I get a lot of information, a lot of that stuff. You know, for me, it's like, oh, you know, I, I didn't like my high school coach, so I transferred three times or I didn't like this. So I just I just stopped doing it like that to me. Like I, I can see right through that. And I don't care how you get, how good you are. You're not going to not going to perform. Yeah, I, and I think that like that mentality is the the crux of the issue. Where I think a lot of people complain about the transfer portal that like there's a quick out in and not embracing kind of the struggle sometimes. But I think everyone, you know, I, I'm not a, a completely opposed to the transfer portal. I just, you know, I think some people too often just say like, oh, they're they're quitting, and that's not necessarily the case. But I think the you know, the, the other part of it that I, I wanted to touch on briefly too, is that the adversity piece that you're talking about too, and having the conversation, like that conversation. And I, I think it's poignant because right, it's likely a lot of these conversations are happening in offices around the country right now with exit meetings at the end of the fall, right? Like you're ha- like, everyone's having exit meet. We're around finals time. Like if you haven't had them already, like you're having them this week or next week, like there's going to be a, a a lot of kids who are going to be told likely for the first time, like, Hey man, like right now you're not good enough to get in the lineup. And, and that becomes a huge piece of like, what, like, what is that going to do to you over the course of the next three, four months? You know, because and real realistically, like you're playing in two and a half ish. Yeah. Two really. Um, you know, so like what, like what can you do over the course of the next eight weeks that, that is, that is going to make you better and you know legitimately help you get yourself in a better position to be in the lineup but i think that that's you know that is a a reality that is currently happening on college campuses regardless of sport but they're happening right now yeah i think i think there's a recruiting piece of this too because i mean you're talking about you're defined by your adversity you're defined by what or you can be defined by how you react to when somebody gives you information you don't like Right. They tell you you're not good enough. You don't throw hard enough. You don't run fast enough. Well, what do you do with it? Do you point the finger at somebody else? Do you make an excuse as to why? Or do you take that information and you go, all right, well, I got three months to figure this out. If I want to make my varsity high school team, coach told me, you know, I'm not throwing hard enough to, you know, I'm not throwing enough strikes or, you know, I'm not good enough defensively to play third base, whatever it is. Well, the kids who go, okay, thank you. Now let's get to work. Those kids are going to be better suited for when they get to college because at some point they're going to sit down with their coach. Almost everybody's going to have a conversation with a coach where they're going to go, hey, man, you got to you got to figure some stuff out. You got to make some adjustments. And uh, I, we deal with that with kids, especially this time of year going into the offseason of, hey, here's here's the honest assessment of where you're at. And you have a choice to make here. How much time do you want to put in the weight room? How much time do you want to put in the hit in the bad cage? Because the next step is you need to have a good high school season and not losing sight of the big picture and uh, how you deal with how, how you deal with and respond to the information that you get. I think it's a game changer for kids. Hundred percent. I mean, like like you talked about, like having the season right in front of you. Like you're, you're never going to be a really good college player if 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 where you're at in high school and you're not a really good high school player. You know, you're never going to have a pro. You're never going to go from a JUCO to a to a division, whatever school, you're not really good where your feet are. You're never going to be a pro if you're not really good where your feet are too. So like, I think that's a, that's a big thing and understand what that looks like. But, you know, like I have a saying that's misery love company, right? So like, that was my motto. Like, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how it is. want to find a way. Like, it's, we're going to figure it out. It's, we're going to make it happen. Whereas a lot of times when, when you have a situation like these conversations are happening is, is People who make excuses have company too. They'll find someone who agrees with them and they think that everybody is always against me or it's always this or whatever it may be. And and those guys, they they flock together and they, they want to find someone that they agree with. You see it on social media. And, and you know, you got the guys that have one way of thinking and they just listen to what they agree with. Well, how, how are you supposed to learn? 
if, if you only surround yourself with people that agree with you all the time, how, how are you going to grow? How are you going to understand? How are you going to look at things differently? So, you know, those guys that are having those conversations, you know, they go back to whatever coach and they say, he says, I need to be a better defender. Well, he's wrong. He, what does he know? Like, like the stuff like that, it's, it's happening everywhere as well. Um, so that's a big part of it too. But, you know, to your point, Keith, about the transfer portal, I think it's, I think it's awesome. I think it's, I think it's a way for, for players to keep, you know, people in check. And I think it's a way for players to, to really take ownership of their career. And, and, you know, I think, I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. Me and Keith have had some, some back and forth on, on that, but it, it's, if you just look at the transfer portal as a negative and you use that as like the easy conversation point, you're missing you're missing the bigger picture. Like almost everything in life, almost everything in college baseball or recruiting, like there's nuance to it. Are there kids who are going to the transfer portal because they think they got screwed? Yeah. There's also a lot of kids who are going into the transfer portal because it came to the realization that they needed to find another place to go be successful. Right. Maybe they they got somewhere and they didn't. You know, they understood like, hey, I'm 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 probably not gonna ever play here and I really wanna be able to play. Like I wanna be able to get on the field. What's wrong with that kid going with somewhere else? I just I don't understand the simplicity of some of the thinking when when the kids get bashed for going into the portals and you made a bad decision. It's like it's it's never that simple and to just cast a kid off as a quitter because he went into the portal, I think it's lazy. And to your point, you kind of got to look at where is the kid coming from and how can I help him get to where he wants to go? Like, I think that's what a lot of coaches who are doing a good job of of leveraging the portal, that's probably how they're viewing it. Not looking at it as like, well, that kid's in the portal and he's a quitter. I just don't think, I just don't think that that's the reality for a lot of kids. 100%. And I think these kids, they deserve options. You know, their career, they, they have one college career and they're going to do it right after high school unless they go into Marines for five years and then do it after that. Um, so, so it's, it's a little different, like, you know, let them take ownership of that. Let, if, you know, if they feel like they made a mistake then they made a mistake. Um, but I view the portal is, is something, you know, very, very rarely do you see people not leave. Um, usually it's opportunity they want to leave and then the people, you know, they want to be around good people. They want to have people that are invested in them. So, so for me, like, the portal doesn't ever scare me, right. Regardless of where I coach at, I don't think the portal will ever scare me. Um, I think, I think being a division two pitching coach as my first job, I think, Division two, hundred percent gets hit by the portal the most. As in return, they they were getting those the division one you know kickbacks previously, and now they're not really kind of landing that stuff. So they're they're recruiting platform you know tr- dramatically as well. That's my little my little the D two guys. Well, I think the flexibility that the portal allows now that you're seeing a lot of D guy D two guys end up moving up to you know bigger. You know, bigger Division One programs. Uh, you know, the one that comes to mind for me is that I know UConn had several Division Two guys, uh, not this past year, but the year before when they were in the Super Regional against Stanford. You know, they had multiple Division Two guys that, you know, five years ago those kids never go to you. They never make it to UConn because they don't really have the option. Like it's just a tougher path to get there. It's a lot cleaner to make that jump now, and I think that's great for kids. Um, I think it's great for kids to have options. And and Keith, I know you have some thoughts on this, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not opposed to it at all. I just, I think that <laughs> I've said this before, like coaches have missed recruiting forever. And I, I don't necessarily think that it's a, a bad thing for kids who are going to have zero opportunity at a, at a school to not have the opportunity to find a, a place where they fit and, and can play and, and have a really good career. And, you know, you're right, Anthony, like it, it's, that we 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 forget that it's you know when when you coach this game and I think when you're around it as much as we all are and have been like it's you constantly get to coach college baseball for I did it for 16 years Andy did it for 10 like it's a constant thing for us like it's a finite window for the for the student athlete like they only get four years maybe five unless we have another pandemic and you get like 20 but you know by and large like you only get four or five years so like. It, 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 if you don't want to waste away for two or three years at a school, like you, you should have an opportunity to be able to go somewhere else. And especially, I, I think they did the right thing in saying that, like, you know, if a coach leaves, you can jump in the portal. Like, I think that's a, an important thing too. Like if you're recruited by a staff and 
maybe you don't get along with the the staff that comes in. Like you should have that option to be able to go somewhere else to to find a better fit. You know, like you weren't recruited by them. Like they likely want to bring in their own guys. You know, and hey, if that presents an opportunity to go somewhere else and, and find a better fit, like you should be able to do it because it's again, it's such a finite window for these kids to be able to play. Like let them do it. You know, I. I don't think it was intended to be kind of free agency the way that it has been, but I think that levels out in the next couple of years once the COVID years come back or, or aren't available, I should say. Like, I don't necessarily know how many you're going to see jumping around, but that's for another day. What, um, you know, when, when you guys start talking about, you know, guys that it's looked that you guys are looking to bring in, like how much, if it, if any stock do you guys put into like rankings from perfect game or PBR or any of that stuff? Like, is it something you look at? Is it something you take into account or is it like we're trusting our eyes and just trying to get the best guy that fits into the program and the style of baseball that we play? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's a scale. I mean, I think that's the, that's the most general statement ever is, is that it's a scale. Um, that means someone has evaluated them. Someone has ranked them above at, at a certain capacity whatever it may be. Uh, to me, it's not an end-all be-all um, to, to us. Uh, I know Coach Tyler Packnick, he's our recruiting coordinator. We've, we've had many conversations about this. Like, you know, we're, we're, willing to, we're willing to be in the best team. We want, to, we want to recruit the best team. We don't need to recruit the best ranked team. We want to recruit the best team. Um, because essentially, your record when they get there, their junior year is, is essentially what, they're, what, what that ranking is going to look like, not what, what, what a ranking is given out. Like that's a big thing for us. Um, so with that, you know, we look at it. We we obviously, obviously, everybody looks at it in a sense of that. You know, my my one of my best players ever was ranked 283rd of, in the in the state of Illinois, and he was batting two through five for us from day one to the last game of the year. So to me, I, I don't take too much stock into it. Like I said, I think it goes back into it a little bit. Um, obviously. You know, without ticking off the PBR and PG guys, um, it is to me. It just they 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 evaluate all summer. They they evaluate what they see, and 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 for us to not use that, I think that's also um, a little bit crazy for us not to look at. Um, but at the same time, it's not an end all be all. Yeah, we seem to get a similarish answer, but it's always slightly different. But I think the big takeaway is it's information that we can use, but it's not going to be a deciding factor. Um, now, you're a pitching guy, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you how – and I'm sure Eric's going to listen to this, so I, I want to make sure that you get a chance to answer this question. But how are you leveraging data from a development and an evaluation standpoint with your with your arms? And if you could talk through – I guess it's two parts. Like, how are you using it in the evaluation process from a recruiting perspective? And then I think my personal biggest interest is how you're leveraging it to help your guys continue to get better. That's oh, that's a great question. Um, I think that the biggest thing for for data, and, and, and anytime I talk about data, anytime I, I, I am talking about it in the bullpen or after the bullpen or, or recruiting, is it's just the tool. And when I say it's just a tool, it's a, it's a tool to get guys out, right? So a guy with really good, really good data numbers at, and travel ball is if he's in the zone, he's probably getting a lot of guys out essentially. So with that, you know, identifying certain factors of it, you know, how does he spin a fastball? The guy could spin a fastball at 2,500, you know, what's his, that for his off speed is spinning more than that, which is probably a pretty good thing. So you just look at it from, a, from at that point, um, at the simplest levels. And then start looking at it as like, okay, and he picks at the top of the zone. If he's getting a ton of swing and miss at the top of the zone at this at this tournament. Why is he doing that? Like, why is that the case? Um, he gets hit, but it's thought same thing. He gets hit bottom of the zone. You can kind of identify some things with that as well. Um, off speed's obviously easy to kind of look at when you're doing the recruiting side of things. Um, you can tell by the swings and you can tell by the takes if off speed's the thing. And I think that's what Kyle was looking at. The, being one of the 400 coaches that is looking at the pitch and then turning around and looking at the track man, you know, screen. I think that's, that's something you can pick up on pretty easily as well. So the recruiting side of things, I think it's, it's, it's real simple as far as that stuff goes. And I think kind of going back into the PBR and PG question was, you know, they provide a lot of information as well. Whereas, you know, you might see a guy, 
you know, he might not be the 9092 with four in his own, but he might be the 9092 guy with with one pitch. He might have a fastball and he spins it and, you know, has has a really good ride to it and and has has some numerical data that you really like. Can we adjust it and can we can we develop it in something else? And I think that's a big part of it too. As far as like the coaching side of things with it, you know, understand that it's a tool, right? So like not every pitcher on our staff can sit there and 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 look at it. And, and decide what it is. Like we're not going to look at a track man report and be like, oh, this is that, this is this. But our job is is to really relay that to them and, and communicate with them. And they need to know what they're looking at. They need to know what we mean. Hey, you can live at the top of the zone and have success. Like, what does that mean? And, and I think a lot of times, you know, looking at data and just running with it is one thing. But you know, like we have we have guys that you know we have a guy that threw all fastballs, all fall pretty much, and he had more swing and misses than I've ever seen. And it doesn't, the data doesn't tell us what we need to know. Um, he just like hides the ball extremely well. And it's just one of those things we roll with. So like we don't mess with it, but it also allows us to, to go back and look at it. Right. So if you say, yeah, a guy that starts, you know, he's, his job is to live at the top of the zone and he starts getting, you know, barreled up at the top of the zone. And he was previously getting, you know, swings and misses the first months. We can go back and take a look at his numbers and be like, Hey, this is why you're getting hit up there now. This is why things are changing a little bit. Let's, look at it let's adjust you off of that data and and I, I think that's a big piece for us you know i think it's i think i think having an understanding of it that it's been that's a tool to get guys out is is a huge thing uh, I, I think it's a big part of baseball now and i think it's a big part of development um and it's also a way to create you know accountability too in a sense that hey like this is your fastball when you're down in the zone this is your fastball when you're top of the zone this is your slider that might look really good on on data, but you can't throw it in the strike zone. Okay, so what's how to what's master a pitch that's in the strike zone? Let's let's make a nasty pitch that's 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 in the strike zone when you want it to be and when it's not when you want it to be. But it's, it's a big thing for us. I love it. I think it's an absolute blast. Um this is obviously a different technology we had when I was in junior college, but you know with anything it's easy to pick up uh, up off on it, you know, using Edertronic, using TrackMan. Um P three came down and we did uh biomechanic reports um using Kenna Traps. So oh, that was the second time I partnered with them. So using that information to dive into the development was it was a really easy thing for me, and it's a really easy thing for our pitchers to understand because you know they want to be invested too. You know, they, remember they only get one college career; like they want to be invested as much as as much as you think they do. Um, and otherwise, they wouldn't be there. They wouldn't be putting in the hours on their own that they want to do. They wouldn't be putting the hours in throughout the day. So using that information to kind of help relay that to them. To try to create the best version of themselves is a huge piece for it. You feel like when you present that information to kids, and I kind of wish that we had a little bit, I'm not that far out of it, but we didn't have quite as much. And and one of the things that I think was always important to get across to a kid, especially the intellect, especially the kids who were thinkers, is if you can get them to understand why you're making an adjustment and it's not just do this because I said so. I feel like you get a ton more buy-in and I got to imagine that when you're able to pull up a TrackMan report and explain to a kid, hey, here's what's going on with your slider right now and we need to make an adjustment to it and here's why we need to make an adjustment, but here's how we're going to try to adjust it. So now they not only got an idea of this is the reason why, but now you give them some direction on, well, at least point them in the direction of the finish line, which is the process that they're going to have to undertake to actually make that adjustment. Do you find that that is, is something you see with their guys that being able to explain that is really helpful? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these, these, these players these days, like if they, if they don't feel it and they don't see it, they're not going to believe it. No matter what you say, no matter what, what it is. Um, and what, which is fine because we're, we're in an information error, right? They can go on Twitter and, and figure out what could be on, on pitching and whatever they not, or that, what they shouldn't be either. So like they, they have all that information to the, at their disposal, at their disposal, you know, be able to relay them and show them like, Hey, like this is where you're at right now. Okay. You're going to be really good attacking hitters this way. You know, using true media to do just that as well. Like, Hey, you're going to attack hitters like this and you're going to have, have a lot of success. Not only does it provide, you know, a developmental buy-in, but it also provides a more confidence thing too, or, where guys are like, okay, I'm ready to go. Like, I, I know nobody's going to hit my fastball up and in because I've been practicing it this entire time. And I know, I know that I have, you know, 22 inches of, um, vert that I'm going to just going to attack the top of the zone. And, and that's going to be that. Um, so I, I think that's a big thing for them. I think seeing it and understanding it as well. 
you know, in our bullpen settings, like we're not diving too, too much into it as we want to keep it fluid and, and keep it moving. But conversations we have with guys, like it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's really exciting when, when you sit there and you talk to them like, okay, Hey, you know, you know, you're down here, you're a low slot guy, borderline sidearm guy, you know, but your fastball has, has a lot of vert. Um, you're forcing fastball can play at the top of the zone. You know, that's an outlier pitch for a sidearm guy. You know, most, most of those guys are always going to be sinker guys. So now you have two fastballs, you can cut the zone in half and, and have a lot of success with that. One example, um, that comes to mind when we talk about this, but, but being able to communicate that with them and be able to show them and, and, and explain to them in a way that they understand. Right. So like, that's a huge thing too, or it's like all this data stuff. So you create, it's great information. But like we talked about with the rankings, it's information. It's how do we apply that information? How do we get them to understand it? How do we get them to act on it? Because if they can't act on it, no information is just useless. If you could real quick, and I, this is really just a, a, a very quick synopsis. Could you just explain to the listeners what true media is? Because we've had some people talk about it, and I think some people don't necessarily understand like what, like we know what it is, and we can have the conversation. But I like I think people listening to this, like they hear it, and they're like, I don't even know what they're talking about. So just very briefly, a synopsis, please. Yeah, no, absolutely. True media is something I was introduced this year uh, from our pitching coach Aaron Everett. Uh, <laughs> true media is one of the best tools I've ever seen. Um, it's a tool that is being used by Division One tools. And basically any other level that has a TrackMan stadium at their at their facility, what it does is it pulls all the video. Um, I think they partner with Synergy, which most I'm sure everybody's more familiar with. But what it does is it pulls all the video, all the data, every single pitch a person throws, puts into a into a file on your on your computer. You go into your computer, you're on it. You know, I you know, for example, if I wanted to see every single swing and miss from Tommy White, um, his last year's season, which isn't very many of them. I'll just put it in true media. I put that filter in and every single pitch with the video, all the data pops right up. I mean, you're talking about an elite scouting report. You're talking about an elite way to attack hitters every single day. You're talking about an elite way to call pitchers. Um, you know, coaches call pitchers at the college level. You know, if, if every single pitching guy is, is locked in and they know exactly how to attack every hitter in the lineup with our best stuff on the mound, uh, you talk about being the most prepared pitching staff in the country, um, regardless of who you play, regardless of who you have on the mound. If, if obviously you attack them with your strengths, but I'll put that in there because a lot of people forget that a little bit. But, um, but yeah, no, it's an absolute great tool. You're able to see hot zones, swing and miss zones, every single thing I like. For me, being a pitching guy, it's a dream because I want to know what you, I want to know what pitches they swing at. You know what pitches they swing at? Um, you know, you can, you can attack them. If you know what pitches they chase, you know how to get them out. Um, you know what pitches they take, you can get them a one real quick. So I, I think it's an absolute great tool. I think if anybody um, has access to it or anybody has never looked at it, I think they should definitely do so. Um, it's out in dream. Yeah, I, when Eric showed me that the first time, I was blown away. I was like, "You got to be! You have all of this, and just the ability to prepare your players." I mean, that's information is power. And if you have somebody who can distill that, if you have a kid who's comfortable taking that information in, or maybe just more importantly, you being able to sit there and develop a really good plan, like it's a game changer. Like you put your kids, the way I look at it is you put your kids in a, in a position to be successful because you have the information that allows you to get at what's going to help them win. Now, obviously they got to go execute and compete, but you kind of put them in a situation where that's really all they have to do. Just go be super competitive and be tough and, and follow through with the plan. Cause we have a really good one here. 100%. Like, and, and when you look at it, man, like, Oh, like we tell these coaches, you tell these players all the time, Hey, you, know, you need to do everything you can check every box, do every single thing you can do every single day to be successful. Well, the same thing for us coaches. Like I, it's, it's, I can't wait for this year. I cannot wait for this year to be now in the open, have a binder, know who's on deck, who's in the hole, knowing how they swing, what they swing at, and, and what pitches they swing and miss at, because I know we're going to do our homework. I know we're going to well, how we're going to call our game against that guy. The bullpen, we can be doing three, four, you know, live live sets with that guy in the batter's box, knowing what's exactly what's going on, you know. So I think it's a huge thing for us to attack players, um, attack hitters in the strike zone, um, and be able to attack their weaknesses with our strengths. I think it's a huge thing. Um, I, it's unbelievable how much information you get from that. And it was, it's kind of unbelievable that I called pitches before at the Juco level and, and, and didn't have that. And I wish I did have that because, you know, you really, you're just looking at your, with your eyes, like you can see what they swing at, what they take. 
Um, but having this information, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, the other piece of this, and we, we touched on it a, t- a little bit with the transfer portal, but I think this is important for listeners to hear that this is the type of information that college coaches have at their fingertips. And it's easier to scout a kid in the transfer portal than it is to scout a high school kid. Because if you think about a kid who threw 40 innings as a freshman, but is looking to go somewhere new, when do you ever get to see a high school kid throw 40 innings? And you can literally watch every pitch or every at bat a kid's takes and get a really good idea of what the kid's capable of and then what he might be capable of, depending on, you know, the lens you view him through for your program, like things you think you might be able to help develop. And um yeah, that just the, the amount of information that's there, it makes it makes those kids easier to identify and easier to understand from a talent perspective. No, absolutely. I mean, there's, it's a, it's a, like I said, it's a scouting, it's a, it's a pregame routine dream. It's a way to plan. I mean, I, I'm sure you guys could imagine playing to beat in a team, you know, with that information. Oh, the scouting reports we used to get were, they were some beauties, huh, Keith? You'd get kids to yeah, be like 86 so... to 88 on the report, and the first bullet would be like 94. Yeah. Our lead yeah. off guy would look in the dugout and be like, what the hell is That's not 88. <laughs> <laughs> this dude's a stock right he's 84 to 6 with no breaking ball and then he absolutely just drops a hammer and he's like 93 to 95 the first the first example or the first cue for us should have been that not one scout left after avery threw nine and was like 94 to 96 and went in the fifth round and then that gentleman ended up going the fifth round too so five one eight guy um you kind of touched on it a little while ago and i, I want to you know pivot a little bit but you know not necessarily from the the social media aspect of you know how you know I, I know there's so much information out there that people can find and you know there's so much you can talk about when it comes to social media whether you like it or not and what you like and what you don't <laughs> um but how how often or, or how much do you use social media and the recruiting process like does it shrink the country for you a little bit more does it you know does it allow you to follow like see some guys that you might not necessarily would have seen otherwise and kind of you know go down that road a little bit more than you you know otherwise would have you know four five six seven years ago yeah no absolutely i mean i think social media is a great tool i mean it goes back to it you know you, you don't you can't be seen if you're never seen so it's a weird thing to say but at the same time you know social media allows it you know, you know, be in one place and see things at once. Maybe for me being a guy, you know, being recruited during the COVID time, it was, it was social media was a huge thing. And, and obviously there's, there's, there's flaws of that as well as, as many teams have seen, you know, that, that the COVID tying and stuff like that, 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 that they took their pull on that a little bit. Um, but like, like I said, you know, be able to see someone on, on video, you know, see stuff like that on social media. I mean, there's, there's, there's no doubt that we're like, Hey, we're going to see this guy. Cause I like what I see on video. It's, it's basically a, a platform for guys to use. I think it's also a platform for guys to, you know, like I said, it's an information area. I mean, guys, they want to know who they're spending their time with and, and they want to know who they're, who they're playing for. And, and I think, I think coaches using social media is a big thing too. I think, I think coaches, you know, sometimes you look at as robots, you know, you go to these camps, you go to these events, you go to these showcases and, and everybody's scared. Everybody's scared to talk to you. They're scared to, to approach you or whatever it may be as far as you know parents and stuff like that everybody just looks at you weird like you're robots and you're just judging everything you see um you know like in recruiting visits you have conversations but you know for me i use social media all the time our whole coaching staff pretty much does as well like we're open books like it doesn't matter to me they know i have a dog like so like when i have recruits on the phone they ask me about my dog like it's we'll talk about my dog i love my dog uh so stuff like that is a huge thing or, or it's they see that we're people and they see that we, we care and we, we still do things and, and we're highly invested. So like, it, I think social media is a tool on both sides. I think it's a tool for, for the guys um, that we're looking at. And I think it's a tool for, for them to see who we are. I think it's a huge thing. You know, you want to surround yourself with good people. You want to surround yourself with people that value your goals and your support. Um, whatever, whatever your goal might be. If you want to be a pilot, I want you to be the best pilot you can ever be. Because if I'm flying with you, you better be pretty good. That's just kind of the way we look at things um, as far as that goes. Um, but identifying talent, for sure. Um, social media is a, is, a, is a great tool to, to put us on guys that we've never seen before. Um, obviously, with, during the transfer portal time, you, you see a ton of video out there. You see a ton of content out there. 
um, it's cool to identify talent. And at that point, you know, that's up to conversation and, and checking out with their eyes. Yeah, social media has changed the game. It really has. Um, I think kids who are listening, you can leverage it and you can use it in a way that's going to help you. And understanding that coaches like yourself, they do actively look at social media as a way to maybe see a kid that they wouldn't have normally seen, or maybe just to do some research on some kid that you already have seen. Um, and I think the one thing would be just, just be thoughtful about what you put up there. And me and Keith had a, we had a good talk about this a couple of weeks back, but um, it's a, it's a big tool. And I think the consensus with the guys that we've talked to is, yeah, we'd be stupid not to use it. And it's something that kind of what you're going back to is that it's a tool for you to recruit, just like track man's a tool for you to develop. Um, it's another piece of the puzzle that you guys can use to, to identify guys. Absolutely. I mean, I guess, and it's fun too, you know, when you talk to these guys and, and you're recruiting a kid, like you're recruiting a kid and you're talking to him and you see he posted, posted a picture and his family went to a, a trip or whatever. And you start talking about it. Like you just ask him what he did, what they did. And he tells you, oh, I did this, did this, did this. Got my throwing in though. Did it on the, did my plows on the beach, you know, like whatever it may be. Like, like there's always good stuff like that. And I, I think it's a great tool um, at every single level. They all use it. We all we all use social media at some capacity, or um, you know, from just kind of like my junior college. I, I did. I, you were the SID. You were the. You were everything over there. So doing the same thing kind of here at Jack State, you know, help run the Twitter with that as well, where we try to you know promote our guys. Like even when they get here, like like give them some love. They spend a lot of time in this place. Like let's let's use it. Let's let's show their friends what they're doing. That's kind of our our big thing too. You talk about the person quite a bit and, you know, you talked about some of the toughness and, and being able to deal with adversity. One of the things I'm always curious about with guys, when you go, when you're there watching a kid is what are some things that he might do on a baseball field behavior wise or around the baseball field, things that you can actually put your eyes on that excite you and, and kind of cue you towards like, Hey, this is a pretty tough kid. This kid's a good competitor. Or some stuff that might be a little bit of a red flag that I don't know if this kid's going to quite be a really good fit. If you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, definitely not the guy that's like, oh, he rolled up in Crocs. Like, I don't want him. Like, that, that's definitely not me. Um, I don't care what you wear to, to the game as long as you're ready to play and be a good teammate. Um, you know, it goes back to it. You know, there's there's a difference as well where – you know, there's there's things I see that that some people would be like, oh, it's a red flag, but then there's things that I see that it's like, okay, they allow that in their program. We don't do that in our program, and that's that's something you're just upfront with them about in the recruiting process. And I, I think that's a huge thing where it's like, hey, like you you slammed your helmet. It doesn't mean I don't want you, but I'm just letting you know if this is the place you're you're coming to, like, you're not gonna slam your helmet. Because the bullpen coach is going to be down there, and he's he's not going to like what you like. He's not going he's not going to have nice things to say to you after you do that. Um, so stuff like that you see, and you're just like, okay, in our program we don't allow that, you know. So you see it all the time when when players do that. The coach does nothing, you're like hey, that's fine. Um, but for me, if the coach does something like that, and the player, you know, obviously goes back at the coach, like hey, that that's that's not something I like, and not something you see. And I've seen that before at the at the showcase tournaments as well. Um, so really being able to be coachable is a big thing. If you're uncoachable, then that's a red flag for me. I think that's a red flag for every coach in the country, I believe. Um, so like for me, it's like understanding their kids, understand they're, they're aware of their surroundings and what they're doing. That, that's a big thing for me, but you know, like things that stick out to me that I like more so than the red flags. Like I love the guy that strikes out in front of, you know, you know, the guy I've watched all year, you know, he's played Juco, he's at 400 on the year. He's got a hundred scouts at a showcase um, at the Puma Classic, and he strikes out in front of all these scouts as every level is watching him. And he stops by in the on deck circle and tells the guy what he's throwing, uh, and and then he tells him exactly what he's doing. I'm out like they're not just blow past him because he's pissed off because of all these scouts that came here to watch him. Like that to me, it signifies a lot more than than the guy that slams his helmet or whatever it may be. So like I look for more so green flags than I do red flags. Yeah, and I, I think that's because you, these kids these days, like they're going to be around their element. Um, whereas you set the standard, like, hey, we don't do that here, and you're upfront with them in the recruiting process. Then that's fine too. 
And then lazy people. I think that's my biggest red flag outside of being uncoachable. Lazy people. I, I, I thought any, any recruit that I ever recruit, the only people that don't like me are lazy people. I, if you're lazy, we're not going to get along ever, no matter what it is, whether it's now. And like, if I'm in a wheelchair one day, like as a senior citizen, like I don't want lazy people next to me. Like, like it doesn't matter. I don't care what it is. So if you're lazy, you're not going to like me. Um, you, you're probably not going to like any coach that's really driven. Um, it's laziness is a choice. And, and if you're the guy that, you know, that rolls up, you know, 10 minutes before your start and then your start's terrible. Like, that's just lazy to me. There's, there's, there's no excuse for that. So laziness is a thing that you can tell. You can look at that a lot, how they play, how they play hard, um, or lack thereof. And, um, that's a, that's a pretty just big, big thing that I've seen, but really like the green flag stuff. Like I like to look at things like that. Like it's, it's fun for me to watch. It's easy to roll up the game and be like, Hey, this guy's talented. And it makes sense that he's going to the SEC. Hey, this guy's talented. Oh, it makes sense. He's going to wherever he's going easy to identify it's 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 who's going to fit and why they're going to fit go ahead Keith. Love that. I, I i've never I, it's super simple and i guess i've never really heard it phrased that way like i look for more green flags and red flags which i think is a, a, an awesome way to to kind of contextualize what it is you're looking for um but on the, on the same hand and i i I agree. Like, I, I don't necessarily fit well with lazy people. Like I don't, I don't rest well. Like I, I got to constantly be doing stuff, but you know, the one thing that I think it, it, it kind of, you know, transitions to, and it was a little bit different when Andy and I played and it's a lot different now, um, you know, is the weight room. You know, I, I think the physicality at the college baseball level at all levels are, is a lot more <clears throat> prominent than it was, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And I know, and I've said this before, like the last five years I spent at RPI, like the physicality at, at the division three level was, it was a noticeable uptick. Like you go watch like the, the, the top tier division three teams, like they're physical, physical baseball teams. Um, you know, how much, how much do you guys get in the weight room? How much do you guys put stock in guys that are, you know, want to be in the weight room and want to get bigger and faster and stronger? And, you know, how, how big is that in, in your program in the recruiting process? Yeah, no, I mean, every program, you know, every single college athletic program, regardless of sport, has a strength conditioning, strength performance, sports performance, whatever you want to word it as program. They, they do. I mean, I, I watch, I come to ours every once in a while, I poke in there just to look at the facility because it's awesome. And I, I see the, the rifle team and the, the bowling team absolutely getting after it. But it's, it's every sport, no matter what it is. Like, I, how how you got to lift weights to bowl? I have no idea, but they do it, and they they're really good at bowling. They're like ranked one in the, one mm -hmm. in the country, first in the country. Like, I don't know how they do it or why they do it, but but it works. So like I'm in on it. So the baseball side of things, I, I love it. Um, I I firmly believe that the only reason why that I was able to get back into it was because I was physically in shape. I was physically strong. I was I was stronger than I was when I played in high school. So for me personally, it was a big piece for me. And then going forward, I think it's. You know, you can't you can't sit there and watch an NFL game and, and, and notice how how strong those guys are and how big they are and how fast they are. You know, there's there's but there's still people I think you know that if you lift weights will make you slow. You know, it, it, it's 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 you know Saquon Barkley was was unbelievable. Like the guy was strong, the guy's a freak. Mm -hmm. But you, you look at these guys and, and you're you're looking at the weight room and you, and you look at how the physicality of it. It's the first thing we see. We roll up to the game. There's no pitches thrown, and the first thing I look at is. is who looks the part, who is big, what they look like, who can grow into it. You know, it, it's easy for pitchers to pull up Jake DeGrom and be like, hey, Jake DeGrom, oh, he's skinny. Okay, well, there's only one Jake DeGrom. All right. And the guy played shortstop in college. But like there's 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 so many different things there that that you look at. You, know, you can't just look at that one guy. And, and everybody's like, oh well, so and so. Well, you're not that guy. Like you're not, you're not, you're not 35 years old in the MLP. All right. You're in college. Like or you're in high school or you're a JUCO. You're, you need to have something that you can provide. Um, physicality is a huge thing. Uh, obviously, guys that are that, that that not like I say looked apart. I guess what everybody says when they're recruiting, you know, they looked apart. Okay, they looked apart means they fill up the uniform. They're they're physically there. It means they work hard in the weight room. All right, even the guys that don't, maybe maybe they maybe they have some things they can add. You know that that was that's a huge thing for us. It's a huge thing for a Jack State. It's a huge thing for every college program that I've been involved with. Um, you know, Louisville, I had Zach Farrell, who's at Grand Canyon now. Um, like 
the dude was, I learned so much in my time there with him that it, it was something that was incredible to see how in depth it went and, and how, how training the weight room and baseball needs to co align. And if they don't, then you're just spinning your tires. Like, like pitcher should be on routines, hitter should be on routines, all based around game days. And then you start to see guys really grow. You start to see guys really buy into the weight room because, you know, their doubles turn into home runs. You see their singles turn into doubles. Like you start seeing things that they've never done before. And it, it's strictly because of the weight room. It, it's strictly because they've invested that time into their, you know, the idea is to be a better baseball player. You work out to be a better baseball player. So, so if, you, if, you, if you think getting bigger, faster, stronger is not going to help you be a better baseball player, then like you have already had different conversations you need to have with somebody because everybody who gets bigger, faster, stronger and put on quality mass, not just mass, um, will be a better baseball player. Couldn't agree more. I coached against Jacob DeGrom. He came off yeah. shortstop. He came off shortstop. Um, I think it was the second weekend of the year. And they were like, Scouting report was like electric. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> and he came off the shortstop and was like all of 97 and 99 in 2010. Like nobody was really 97 and 99 back then. And it was like, wow. Um, why is he playing short? But you'd also watch him throw it across the diamond and, you know, hit doubles in the gap. And you're like, ah, that's the most athletic kid on the field. Doesn't matter where he goes. It was absurd. Yeah, I, I I couldn't I couldn't even fathom thinking y'all let's get to their bullpen let's get to their bullpen and then they take their shortstop and put them on the mound and throw them ninety nine like I I couldn't even fathom that came in uh, he came in I'll never forget he came in against Dan Palini I've said this before in here like who he got drafted in the ninth round he had forty he had forty eight or forty nine home runs in three years at Siena I mean the dude could flat out roll the pole. But like, I was like, this is going to be awesome. Like, this is power on power. Like, let's see what happens. And DeGrom went up and in and hit him in his shoulder. And I thought, Pay, like, Peo's a tough kid. Like, I, he like recoiled and like fell down. And I was like, all right, <laughs> can't be that bad. And after the game, the scout was like, yeah, that was 98 that he caught <laughs> in the arm. <laughs> oh, yeah, God. That that's one good. way to intimidate the best hitter in the lineup. Just, just buzz his tower. God, he was good. Yeah. Um, another quick question on um, – I lost my train of thought there. I'm thinking about Peo trying to take DeGrom deep. Um, just get smoked in the shoulder. Oh. Oh. Like right above right above the Evo shield on his arm, like right in the tricep. I was like, oh, that one hurt. Yeah, and then you got the guy in the stand. Don't rub it. Don't, <laughs> don't touch it. Yeah, probably uh, the same guy that his red flag is when the you know mom brings a Gatorade to the kid in the middle of the summer when it's 115 degrees on the turf. Yeah, <laughs> I know you. I know Cross you can't that kid it. off. I know you can't drive the game, but you should yeah. pack a cooler. <laughs> <laughs> my wife used to bring my wife used to bring me coffee when it was like 32 degrees and we're playing a doubleheader. Like, does that make me a worse coach? Like, come on. Kid can't drive. He had to be there hours before. He can't drive. I'm like, let the kid get a Gatorade from his mom. What are we doing here? It's Ugh. it's really easy to find reasons to not like a kid. And I I liked your. I really liked. I want to kind of double down on what Keith said. I really like you looking for green flags because a lot of coaches, and if you're listening, a lot of coaches do this, and I think the really good ones view it the way that you do, which is let me find reasons why I like this kid. And then if there's really severe red flags and they're not hard to find either, but going in with the idea of like, what can this kid do to help me win? Like, you're never going to get a perfect kid. Like, you know, I don't know, maybe if you're at LSU, you might get that five tool kid like Dylan Cruz or Arkansas or something. But the reality is most programs, like you're getting a kid who doesn't, there's something he doesn't do extremely well. And if you nitpick on that, you might miss out on a kid who's a really good player. So I, I, I just love the, I love the lens of that. Like I'm looking for green flags and uh, I'll be using, I'll be coining that term in the future with, yeah. with coaches. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like it's like, like you said, it's, it's real easy. And, and, you know, it's, you look at it when you're an honest and you're recruiting honestly and you're recruiting, you know, I like everybody knows like when I'm recruiting or when I'm talking to a kid or they have them on campus, like, Hey, you're going to be pushed every day. It's going to be hard. And some days you, you might hate me. And that's okay. But just understand that 
I'm investing all my time and effort to make you better because you have one college career. And, and when you're honest about guys like that, it's easy to look for green flags. Um, if you if you can't do that, you can't invest into the to the players that much, and and you can't you know can't be there be like hey like this is why you can't do that. This is why we don't do this here. Then then it might be better for you to look for red flags, and, and because then you can't you can't, you can't fix it. You can't you know change that from them. But for me, it's it's more so like why why do I want you in my why do you want why do I want you in our program? Why why do I want you to represent who we are as coaches? Like that's a huge thing for me. I, I think it's easy to look at. You know, now like social media is a great tool. We're all right, but but now it's just also a platform just to be negative all times too. Um, so when if, if that's kind of your style, that that's your style. But for me, it's you know, who who do I want them to tell their kids about? I want them to come into our program and tell their kids how they had their college career. I want them to move on and play professional baseball and and tell their teammates where they develop. I want them to tell their their grandkids, their kids. Like you're gonna tell your kids all, no matter who you are. No matter how long you played, no matter, how matter, no matter where you end up, you're going to tell your kids about your freaking college career. You're just going to, and, and you want to be the best experience possible. I got my train of thought back with the with the question I wanted to ask, which is, what do you think are some of the steeper learning curves for kids when they get to campus as a freshman? I, I think off the bat, the steepest learning curve in general is just time management. You know, it, that's that's every freshman's issue or, you know, not every freshman's issue, but that's if, if that's the first issue they come about is is time management. And, you know, that's a that's a big thing, um, you know, being able to understand that, like, hey, like 90 percent of the programs in the country, if you're a freshman, you're in study hall, your first semester minimum and, and getting those hours and understand that you have to go to those, understand that it's not a choice, you know, typically um, through the academic you know services. That's something that you have to typically do. Um, and meet those requirements, you know, to ins- ensure that you're handling your business on, off the, on the classroom side of things. The time management's a big thing. And then, you know, the next biggest thing is, is there's some guys that cannot cook in college. Like, believe it or not. I mean, one of our first stories I heard someone tell me about them cooking, they put a, they put a, a plastic, they put a plastic, um, chop cutting board in the oven with a pizza on top of it. And it just absolutely melted and it caused the fire department to come in and about burnt their apartment down. So I'm getting a phone call at, at Parham College about how a kid put a plastic pizza cutter in the oven. And I'm thinking, I'm like, I, what do you want me to do about it? I am a head coach. I, I'm not his parents. I didn't teach him to cook frozen pizzas. Like you look, you look at it and you're like, and you, you look at it and you're just like, oh my gosh. Like it's just, it's just not having someone there to do those things. Like that, that's a big thing where they have to, you know, survive on your own. Like if you don't go to, you don't go eat at the dining hall and you want to have a snack, like don't put, don't put coffee boards that are made out of plastic in the oven, like uh, simple stuff like that. But, uh, but no, so time management's a big one. Um, understanding that just because everybody else is doing something doesn't mean you should. And, and understanding that, that, you know, that's a big culture thing too, where it's like, you know, what the weekends look like. The season, what the weekends look like, they should be, you know, how, how are we going to win this weekend? How, how are we going to make sure we're ready to rock and roll, spend time with one another and, and enjoy their company and, and, and really become, you know, more than just, just teammates, but friends, you know, you know, college baseball, you know, they're great camaraderie there. You know, there's a lot of time spent the housing situation. Typically they all live in together. Um, so there's, there's, they're building a lot of camaraderie there and they get to meet people from all throughout the world. And, and, you know, you look at some of the most diverse, you know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be part of two of the most diverse, you know, communities, and that's the college athletics and, and military. You know, so you look at the most successful organizations, successful committees, and and whatever it may be, they're very diverse. And so is college baseball. So you got all these background people. You know, put them in one spot. You know, they're going to learn a ton about each other. They're going to learn a ton, and you see guys all the time. Probably in your guys' organizations, you know, you see you see people all the time. You know, that they become friends with guys from New York. And then two, two, two years from now, you'll see them in New York for something and they're visiting their friends they met. They're, you know, they're somewhere else and, and they're visiting that teammates, you know, like that stuff that to me is, it's so valuable. Um, but understanding that you don't have to do something just because someone else is doing it, it is a huge thing as, as far as learning curve to, to get into college. So you got your time management, um, the ability to not melt plastic cutting boards and, um, the ability to, to, you know, build camaraderie without, you know, doing anything crazy. We had a uh, we had a similar situation when I was in college. <laughs> he'll, he'll remain unnamed, but please tell the story. 
we had a young man who was from um, New Jersey and uh, two very quick points about that. Um, in New Jersey, they don't pump like you, they pump your gas for you. So when he drove his car to college, he called us from the gas station. He had no idea how to pump his own gas into his car. Um, we had to legitimately drive to the gas station and show him. Um, and he also put a um, plastic Tupperware container of meatballs and sauce on the oven, um, on the stove, and just tried to heat it up. And no one was really paying attention. And he lifted it off of the stove and the whole bottom just fell out. And he was like, I, what do you want me to do? My mom said just to heat it up. And it was like, man, like, how have you lived this long? And this is where we're at. We, we, he was 20. <laughs> Love him. Super successful dude. That's the best part about it. Like, this dude is super successful. But at 20 years old, couldn't pump his own gas, didn't know how to cook food. Absurd. It, it, it's unbelievable. And like, you take it for granted a little bit. And she's like, how do you do that? Yeah. Yeah, it just slaps it on the on the on the stove and just expects it to be all good. <laughs> the um all right, so we'll you know, I we don't want to take up too much of your time and and please hang out when we when we wrap up here. I wanna I wanna ask you a question offline. But um, you know, uh, to to kind of wrap up, you know, what what advice would you give to a a kid in a family that's going through the recruiting process now, whether they're twenty five, sixes, sevens, whatever? Um, you know, but what type of advice would you, would you give to a family? That's a great question. Um, off the bat, I think now more than ever, I think instead of looking at what others think and, and, and look at all the outside factors that you can't control first, look at that last. Okay. Evaluate your, your, your player, evaluate yourself, ask a trusted coach what they think. Ask a trusted parent what they think, whatever it is, and, and do a self evaluation. And then, like we talked about earlier, you know, be able to close the gap. Like, okay, I'm this, you know, in order to get where I want to be, I need to do this, this, and this. And I have time because of the recruiting standards right now. So you look at it that way and you're like, okay, I'm this far away. I need to do this, this, and this. Oh, so you can control that. You know, you, you can't control the college coach whether or not they want to overlook. You know your eight second sixty time or whatever that whatever that is. You, know, you can't control that, but what you can control is, is let's make it better. Make it let's make it more more lucrative. Let's let's make ourselves better and invest into what we need to do in order to develop. Tour we're a no brainer at that point. Um, I, I think. You know, I think it also it looks at it this way too. It's it's not always a business. You know, I love recruiting. Uh, I love recruiting for a simple fact that this is the only only you know level of baseball where you really get to pick your players and it's like okay i'm gonna bring you here i want you to want to play for us and i want to impact your career in as best way possible and, and moving forward i want you to take what you learn here and take it to pro ball with you and you look at stuff like that too where it's like we're, we love recruiting like we we love recruiting in a sense that we want people that want to be part of this we want people that want to come develop here and, and learn here and do those things Oh, you know, so understanding that it's not always a business. Um, at the same time, uh, understanding that you have to do what you can in order to control what you control. We have specific needs, you know, understanding that as well. You know, if you're, if you're at 2026 and you run a, a six, four laser speed, laser speed 60 time, you know, and you want to go to this school and we'll just, I'm not going to say a school because that's you know, whatever, but you want to go play for the New York Yankees. All right. And you're an outfielder. Okay, well, there's nobody in the New York Yankees outfield that runs a six four. Okay, they all have they all hit home runs and they, they're a bunch of power oriented teams. Identifying and do a self evaluation of who you are, and also do a self evaluation on where you should be wanting to go. Because not every team recruits the same. Not every team lays out the roster the same. You might be a six four runner, but there might be you might be wanting to go to a school that they don't have any fast guys in the outfield. They want guys who can bang it, and that's fine. That's their recruiting model. That's okay. It doesn't mean you're not good enough. It means. That you don't fit the need that they have, and and you should look at a place that that is more so your style of play. And I think understanding that and 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 looking into that, and and trying to develop individually going forward, I think that's a huge part of it. And I think it helps alleviate a lot of stress. You know, I, I think a lot of people panic too fast, and they, they want to panic so early that it's okay. There's college baseball for every single person that really wants to play college baseball, whether they like it or not, whether they want to go somewhere or not, or whether it's a D three juco. 
somewhere in Idaho. I, I have no idea. But there's levels of baseball for everybody if they want to do the work to get there. And I, I think that's a big thing. You know, I think that the people that, you know, my biggest, like, like I said, my biggest point of all of this is control what you can control. And then don't look too much into the whole recruiting thing as being, you know, oh, they don't think I'm good enough or, or whatever it may be. But as how can I get better and do they recruit the type of player that I am and go where you're wanted? You know, I think that's a huge thing. When I say go where you wanted, it's a very broad statement. You know, I think there's a lot of players that are wanted by a lot of coaches, but go where it fits your mold, go where it fits your, their need, and, and then go be a dude. You know, when I say go be a dude it means you've done everything the last three, four years in order to put yourself in a position to be successful. Obviously, now with the, with the early ages, the 2026s, you know, there's a ton of guys that are committed to, to you know, big schools already where that's a small class. But now, you know, the 27s, possibly 28s, you know, we'll start to kind of see a little bit, you know, with the, you know, what that recruiting, you know, restraints look like now. But I think that's the biggest thing is, is, is just make yourself a no brainer. It's some good advice. I hope everybody's listening. Um, I mean, control what you can control. Like it's so simple and it, it seems cliche, but I think a lot of, to your point, a lot of kids lose sight of, like, hey, let's get let's be recruitable first. Like, let's focus on development. Let's focus on being a guy who's who's a guy who can legitimately go play at the next level. Um, once you check that box, uh, the baseball stuff will usually sort itself out. But I, I think the big thing that you mentioned that I think is really important, and it's something we stress with the guys that we work with, is you want to go somewhere where you feel like you're playing for guys that you really want to play for. Like at the end of the day, if you're the kid's going to to Jacksonville State, he's going to be with you for he's going to be with you more than he's going to be with any other person outside of his teammates. You, you want to feel pretty good about the guys that you're going to play for and that they're invested in you to get better as a person and a player. And I mean, obviously you scream that as a, as a, as a coach that you, you, your give a shit level for the kid is super high. Like that's the kind of place you want to go and play. You want to go somewhere where the coach is going to challenge you, but also that you know that that guy cares about you and he cares about you doing well. Um, and that gets lost in the shuffle times because you get you get caught up with the big big shiny stuff and you lose sight of the stuff that's actually really really important, which is who are you surrounding yourself with on a daily basis, and that coaching staff is going to be a huge piece of that puzzle. Uh, absolutely, I mean, I, I think it's a it's a huge thing, and I obviously you know you should you should your give a shit should be, be <laughs> like I said when you, when you view it when you view college baseball is this is their limited time. And not, it's not about your career. It's about their limited time here. How can you make them get better from point A to point B? And, and I, I think every single day, you know, I, I'm reminded of that when I see guys, they do things they didn't do when they got there or they, they develop and, and they move on. You know, like that was, it was a, it was a big thing for me. Um, obviously going through it, Juco is a huge thing there too. On my last year of junior, as a junior college head coach, every single player moved on to a four year tool, every player. And it was the first time in years. You know, at that point, because some guys, you know, they get out, they go to the military or they, they do whatever else it is they're going to do. Um, but every single guy. And, and to me, that, that screams volumes of, of, of kind of the way we did things there and, and kind of the way we should do things. You know, I, I think it's a huge thing. You know, when you spend that much time with people and you, you, you're, you know, you're leading a group of men, you know, I think that's a huge thing. Their goal should matter. And they, they should matter. And you should attack their weaknesses. You, you should attack them weaknesses every single day. You should give them the tool they need. In order for them to attack their weaknesses every day, because if you make their weaknesses strengths, then you're gonna be pretty good. Love it. I think that's a great place to end. Um, thank you so much for your time, Anthony. Really Thanks, appreciate man. it, man. Um, good luck this spring. And you know, the other thing I want to say is thank you for your service, man. I mean, Keith are both tied to the military in various different ways, and um, yeah, it, really glad we had you on, and really thank you for your time. Yeah, thanks for your time. Thanks for your service, man. It was awesome. Yeah, no, absolutely. It was a blast. Like I said, you know, like my time in the Marines was, was awesome. You know, I got to meet some of the best people in my life, got to shape me to do this. And now I get, now I get to coach college baseball. So it's it's all real. But I really appreciate you guys inviting me. Um, you guys are awesome. I love that you guys are spreading, you know, the word of the game and, and, and different backgrounds, right? So I went through and kind of watched some of your guys' stuff and you guys had a lot of really cool guests. So like, it's pretty cool for me to be on this. And you guys have had guys like Matt Hobbs and, you know, the recruiting guys from, from places like Wake Forest and, and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. And obviously, so, um, you know, being the Red Fox on here. So that's pretty cool for me to be able to be invited to that. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Well, thank you everybody for listening. We'll catch up with you next week. Thank you for listening this week. If you're watching on YouTube, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and smash that like button for us. Check us out on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, as well as Spotify. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at EMD Baseball. If you want to find out what me and Keith do to help families and players navigate the recruiting process, go ahead and check us out on emdbaseball.com. Take a few minutes to check out our new online academy. I promise you'll get some good information out of that. Thanks again for listening. Check in with you next week.